had to step back and I had to realize, I'm like, why did I get into art to begin with? I always tell people, find something that inspires you and then try to recreate that. These are EJ Hassenfratz and Jonathan Winbush, multi-award winning artists and two of the most respected educators in the 3D and VFX community. They've worked alongside industry giants like Marvel, Warner Brothers, National Geographic, School of Motion, and many more. What was the first thing that came into your mind when you watched the Sora AI video? It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we go through this a lot. Like something comes out, makes a big splash, everybody gets hyperactive, and then... Once I discovered that, you know what, if I want to learn lighting, I, I shouldn't be searching for how to light in X software. I should just be looking at how do I all these things where once you learn about them and are made aware of them, it's like seeing the code in the matrix. What do you guys think about the future of Fortnite? I definitely think there's a big future for interactive experiences. Like if Samsung's a client, you could say like, hey, why don't we build Samsung World? It's just creating another media for artists to create and hopefully make money from. I think that's very empowering for artists. This is going to be one hell of a podcast episode because both of you are goats in the industry and so many people look up to you guys and I cannot wait to see where the conversation goes. All right, everybody, welcome to the Bad Decisions Podcast. We got EJ and Jonathan in the house today. This is the very first time we got returning guests on the pod. And this is the very first time we have four people on the pod. So this episode is super special. <laughs> I love it. You even have a soundboard now, too? Hell yeah. <laughs> yes, we upgraded from last go. time. Nice. All right. It's like a real morning awesome. show uh, Wasn't expecting that, that's dope. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, it's, it's going to be an awesome one. We actually, by the way, for anybody watching this, this is happening online. And we just told EJ and Jonathan as well, just like during the COVID-19 days where there was online meetings and people talked over each other, it could potentially happen. So forgive us if that happens. We're trying our very best here, but this is going to be one hell of a podcast episode because both of you are goats in the industry. And you know, like you guys are amazing. So many people look up to you guys and, you know, it's going to be one Beautiful episode. I cannot wait to see where the conversation goes. I appreciate you guys as always. You guys are up there with that goat status too. I hear about you guys all the time. So you guys are doing good work out there. Yeah, you guys are, have blown up since we've been on. I think there's no coincidence that after Winbush and I came on, it's just you guys are <laughs> gangbusters. Not saying there's a direct correlation, but you know. All right, you right. Know, we that's why we had credit. to come back, right? We gotta, you know, <laughs> guys, yeah, our, our view skyrocketed <laughs> right after the episode. Actually, it was planned. Me and Fire were thinking, who do we need to get on? Winbush <laughs> and EJ. And then it just worked out right <laughs> after that, man. It was amazing. And You're that's one why. million now. <laughs> yeah, you see, the thing is, we realized that our numbers were not doing so well anymore. So we decided, you know what? It's time <laughs> again. Get <laughs> we got to bring both of them back. And that, that, is, that is why this episode <laughs> is happening. <laughs> I see. Awesome. But, Get the boost going. Yes, Let's exactly. Exactly. Well, jokes aside, guys, it it is just an honor to have you both on the pod again. I have to say that you guys have done some amazing work also over the past few months. Or I, I would say it's about been a, a year. I, I think it's 11 months to a year that we talk last time. Yes. And so much has happened and we're going to cover all of it. But for everybody watching and listening, we're going to be talking about GDC today, State of Unreal, that happened. You're going to be talking about UEFN, of course. EJ, we saw you dropped a Cinema 4D course, which we want to know a lot more about. We saw your 3D printing videos. We got to get deep into that. There's so many more topics we're going to cover. So everybody, please stay tuned. First thing I got to say, we're so jealous. Jonathan, I believe you're the only one from here that went to Sit of Unreal GDC. How was it? I mean, I only went for one day, but it was really dope. Like, I haven't been to GDC since the pandemic, so it was really cool going back up there to San Francisco, just seeing everything that's happened. And, yeah, everything was back in full effect, like... Way GD or the way SIGGRAPH used to be back in the day, that's how I felt GDC was now. Like everything was packed to the brim, everybody was out there, even schools. Like me and EJ, we just went to Ringling College a couple of months or a couple of weeks ago, and they were out there. They had a booth, um, you know, Unreal had a huge booth, Rive had a booth. Um, I was there with 3D Connection showing mm -hmm. the Space Mouse stuff, but yeah, it was just amazing. Like everybody in the industry was there, so got to run into a lot of people as well. Amazing. What was the coolest thing that you saw at GDC this year? 
Um, besides myself. <laughs> 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 That's a good one. Besides yeah. yourself. <laughs> no, I would have to say the cool, the two coolest things I saw was, of course, the Unreal Engine booth, which was massive. They probably had the biggest booth that was there. They had the giant llama there that was all built from Lego bricks, which is really cool because they were pushing the, the Lego Fortnite stuff mm -hmm. that they, you know, they currently opened up for creators. Mm -hmm. And then also the Rive booth. I know Rive has been on the rise a lot lately and mm -hmm. they introduced their Unreal Engine integration. So, you know, like Rive with the Unreal motion design stuff, it's going to be a very powerful combo coming up. Can you tell everybody what Rive is all about for anybody that doesn't know in the audience? Yes. Yeah, so... Like, I haven't dove too much into it, but it's like a 2D animator, right? So mm -hmm. I would think, like, they don't want to be compared directly to After Effects, but mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with it, I would say it's more along the lines of motion graphics with After Effects. Mm -hmm. So a lot of 2D effects, but the cool thing is you can not only render with it, it's interactive as well. So if you wanted to make web um, web applications or, of course, you can interact, integrate it into Unreal Engine, like, there's a whole lot more that you could do, more than just render with it. So think of it as like a 2D version of After, uh, I say After Effects, but a 2D version of Unreal Engine. Oh, interesting. Interesting. That's very cool, actually. Yeah. EJ, did you get to watch the state of Unreal or, or anything about GDC? Yeah, I mean, the whole motion graphics thing that dropped. I mean, Wimbush and I have known about the Project Avalanche. I mean, everyone's known about the Project Avalanche for quite a while, and especially at School Motion. Like, we're always like, with so many applications that teach, like, what do we need to, what do we need to start teaching? And Rive is definitely one of those things. Like when Bush said, it's like, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting time for artists because one of the cool parts about Rive is that if you're an animator and you come from the after effects world and you want to develop for web or, I, you know, apps like Duolingo, the team mm -hmm. at Duolingo, they have the in-house uh, team that was used to be called Gunner based out of Detroit. And they're just a bunch of After Effects animators that got hired by Duolingo, got brought inside, and now they're doing all these animations, but they're doing it for an app now. And Duolingo's like blown up. They did a Super Bowl ad. And so it's just super cool that like Rive and even like Spline 3D and now Unreal mm -hmm. Engine, like I, I can see a bunch of say 3D artists coming from Cinema 4D or Blender going into uh, Unreal, getting that like hooked on the uh, the uh, that that the gateway drug that is like the Unreal motion design, and then realize like, oh, I only need to take a few more steps to start creating like Fortnite levels, like what mm -hmm. Winbush is doing right now, and start getting into games. So I think it's very. I think you have you know, the pressure of AI on one side, but then you have all these other opportunities opening up on the other side for artists that can take all their skill sets and, and apply it to, say, web or app development or games. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's kind of stressful, but also exciting times as well. Actually, since you brought up the idea of, of School of Motion and how you guys are looking at, you know, what is the next big thing? Where is most of the attention at now when it comes to people wanting to learn something new? Is it in animation, motion graphics? Is it in modeling, texturing? Which software are people looking forward to the most? I would say Unreal's always been hot because, you know, we had Winbush create a course last mm -hmm. year and that's gone gangbusters, like almost a thousand yeah. seats sold there. And I think Rive is that new hot thing now just because of how much buzz it's been it's been getting, especially with the integration with with Unreal. So, you know, you have things like I know a lot of people are getting into you know, sculpting now too, with things mm -hmm. like Nomad Sculpt making that accessible on the iPad. Like me personally, like I'm I'm totally obsessed with sculpting yes, on the iPad. Yes, we see that. We see that yeah. on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, and then you got, you know, ZBrush for the iPad that got announced who knows what what's going on with that but uh it's definitely exciting times like things are there there's a lot more apps to learn these days but a yeah. lot of these apps are seem fairly easy to learn so at the end of the day it's it's like <laughs> You know, you can learn Rive and you can learn Unreal Engine, but if you suck at lighting, if you if you're bad at composition, if you're bad at animation, like it doesn't matter. It's garbage in, garbage out. And so that's kind of the whole 
that's our whole message at school of motion is that we'll teach you in after effects or cinema 4d, but it's not, we're not teaching you the software you're, we're teaching the fundamental techniques that just happen to be taught in an after effects or, or Mm -hmm. a cinema 4d. So that, that's our whole thing is if you're going to have to learn totally different apps two years from now, you're not wasting your time, you know, learning all these technical things about this very specific app. No, you're learning how keyframes, a keyframe, right? Like a keyframe works the same way in after effects that it doesn't arrive, that it doesn't unreal. So if you know how to do that, well, then you're way more adaptable and you'll be way more success, uh, successful in the future. I think that's very important. Nick from Grace K Gorilla was on the, on the pod a few weeks ago, and he was also emphasizing how important it is to learn the fundamentals. And then when you learn the fundamentals, it doesn't matter what software you use. Yes. You can bring your knowledge from one software to another. But the question that comes up with that many, that many options that now all the artists that have, what would be the best path to start? How do they make a decision? I mean, I would say uh, if you're trying to figure out what you want to do, uh, like for my 3D course, it, it's, it's really with, with any type of software, you don't have to feel the need to learn every single thing there is about mm-hmm. that software. Like I've used Cinema 4D for pff, way longer than I'd like to admit getting up there in age, <laughs> but I probably only know like 10, 15% of like all yes. It, all that is included in Cinema 4D. And so that that's the right mindset to get in there is, is knowing that you don't have to learn everything, and especially mm-hmm. these days. Like if you know how to animate, if you know how to uh, light well, especially in mm-hmm. 3D, like lighting is huge. Like there's that's such a weak point for a lot of people. And so if you focus on all those things and then just kind of figure out like, what do you enjoy about this? Like mm-hmm. one of the things that I hated going into cinema 4d was like, I was not a big fan of like particle Sims or even rigging at the time. But then I found out that, you know, after working with it, like actually I do like doing characters and okay, I guess I got to do some rigging and stuff like that. But I don't think you'll, you'll really understand what you enjoy about 3d and st- until you start getting into it or w- with any app, like what do you, what do you like about after effects? After effects can do everything thing but if you don't like vfx well that's fine then do some you know 2d animation and after fix it it does so many things you no, you yeah, always absolute, tell people sorry jonathan please go ahead oh no i would say uh real quick i always tell people like find something that inspires you like a project that you see maybe like a commercial or a show opening you know like anything that inspires you and then try to recreate that and that's the best way to learn so like if you like a particular show open say okay i know i need 3d for this i know i need 2d for this let me go and learn exactly what i need to replicate this and then from there you know go start making your own stuff because like ej said like i know just a small percentage of all these programs but i knew enough to get the project done and at the end of the day that's all that really mattered I love that so much. It's but so wait, wait, true. If, if you guys say you just know a little percentage of the software, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, me and you are like 0.01 percent of anything. <laughs> but That's I mean, you you guys are getting into all this stuff too, like the photogrammetry and all that. But mm. I mean, you you don't have to learn that much to to no. get something workable, bring it into Unreal, mm. and yeah, Winbush had mm. the the perfect thing. Is is it's kind of why school motion functions the way it does is it's it's project based so you don't have to think about mm. what what do i make with this it's like no you mm. here's a bunch of different projects you can do and learn all these different techniques and and i think even especially if you're going down like the tutorial rabbit hole if you're just like i want to learn 3d but no if you were like i want to learn sports graphics or how do i animate this mm. logo you're really drilling down and i think that's that's the the getting past that paralysis by too many options. Like if you have unlimited options and unlimited things to do, you're going to be paralyzed by all the choice and you're not going to do anything at all. So it's very important to find how you drill down in that, you know, whether it's, you know, I'm going to make this really cool uh, Star Wars open, like with <laughs> your guys' new Unreal course. Congrats thank on that, by the way. Um, thank you. But I think thank that you. that's what you need to learn is you need to have that end result because I, I've, mm. I've followed some courses that it's just a lot of this button does this, this mm-hmm. button does this, and you're not making anything. And I'm just like, you, you lost me. Yes. No, absolutely. When I remember when uh, I was doing Jonathan's Unreal Engine five-day course as well on YouTube, 
it's because I see the end result. That's what motivated me. When I was doing Blender Guru's donut tutorial, I knew I'm going to make the donut. That was, that was what kept me motivated throughout the entire journey. And so that's why we tried to have that Star Wars hanger at the end, just to show people, like, you get to do this. And Star Wars was Farhad's idea. It was like, actually, people really like Star Wars. So regardless, this is going to motivate them and inspire them to learn. That's the whole point. We want people to get that feeling of, I can actually make this, this is possible, and by the way, I like Star Wars, so why not? We, we were in, uh, in the street the other day, and then this girl showed up, and she said, I'm doing the course, and I was like, you no watch Star way. Wars? <laughs> wait, wait a minute, I'm, I'm surprised that you watch Star Wars, and, and, and I was like surprised by that. But I, I want to go back to one thing that uh, Jonathan mentioned, which is amazing, and that is finding something that you love, uh, uh, a movie or a series, and then the fact that you want to recreate that. Every single time I watch something super cinematic, the first feeling I have is like, can I make that in Unreal? I, I, I'd like to try making that scene in Unreal. And you have to really act on that in that very moment because that ship is going to sail. If you have that feeling, it will happen at some point in your life. You'll see a, a painting or you'll see a movie or a photo and you want to recreate it, no matter what form of art that you have. You should go ahead and do that immediately, like that day or the next day. And that's how I think you can improve and also not feel demotivated sometimes. Because sometimes you kind of get lost in the path. You don't know what you should do next. And I feel like those recreations of other people's art is always a great way to learn and also just to keep, keep yourself motivated at times. I always have that with movies. I don't know about you guys. When I watch Dune, I get that feeling. When I watch Star Wars, I get that feeling. I'm like, I, I want to recreate that in, in Unreal or, or Blender or whatever. Yeah, some of my early popular tutorials, even before Unreal, like I used to do a lot of cinema and um, X Particle stuff. And how that came about was I was actually watching How to Train Your Dragon at the movies. And I remember it to this day. There was a scene where there was this giant whirlpool and it would just look so cool. And I'm like, I wonder if I could recreate that with X Particles. And it took me down this rabbit hole for like a year and a half of just doing like a ton of fluid simulations. And I put them up online, did the tutorials and they kind of took off in their own right there. But like you said, like you watch stuff and you get inspired and you want to go home and immediately try to recreate that. Yeah, no, no, 100%. Wait, listen. Did you know that you can create highly photorealistic scenes with photogrammetry by taking in what exists in the real world into 3D? We've been using Polycam to do exactly that using our phone and drone. Yes, that's right. And guess what? They sponsored this video to give you guys 30% off their pro plan. So you guys can go ahead and try it for yourself. Use the code BADDECISIONS in the link in the description. And you know, I also want to now go back to what EJ was saying about fundamentals. Farah, you were talking about Ooh. that the entire day today. So I was saying that how important is it to learn the fundamentals. And the problem that I see most of the artists have is they jump into the software without knowing how to light, how to use the camera, but they also don't know what is the right source of learning the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. How do I get the lighting right? How do I get the camera right? And I think the moment they learn about it, they can easily learn Unreal, Cinema, or any other software that they go to. Where did you guys learn your fundamentals when it comes to different art forms, cameras, lighting and all that was it within the software or was it outside in the real world yeah actually for me it was at university like i went to school i got my uh, bachelor's degree for this program you know on um, cinema or not cinema for visual effects and motion graphics and the thing that i liked that they taught us at university even though i didn't like it at the time was before we touched any software we had to actually practically use whatever we're trying to learn. So if it's cameras, we actually had to rent out cameras, learn the physical cameras, how the lens work, you know, the ISOs and just how everything worked in the real camera because virtual cameras are just a replica of a real mm -hmm. camera. So if you know how a real camera works, then you know how it's going to work virtually. Same thing with lighting, how the lighting gets affected once it's inside the different lenses and all those different things. So I think having like practical experiences and learning how that works. So even if you just get like a cheap DSLR are like that could be really helpful and fundamental into how to work like your compositions like you hold up your camera like i go hiking a lot i used to do this a lot with my dslr i would just take photos everywhere just kind of seeing how the lights would refract through the lens and how the shadows would affect and how you're getting like the soft lighting and even how like lights actually travel through like foliage and stuff like that like mm -hmm. all those little details make a difference when you go into 3d so i know everybody wants to jump into the software but knowing how stuff works practically puts you that much further ahead than any artist out there mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I didn't go. I mean, I, I was a fine arts major, but I didn't learn any of the lighting, cinematography stuff in school at all. It was almost like I started learning After Effects and, and Cinema 4D, and was like, "Why does my work suck?" <laughs> and and I had to realize it's like, "Oh well, I'm not I'm not learning what makes a great composition. I'm not learning lighting." And then slowly over time, I I, I would look at you know how to light good in cinema 4d and what i found is that you have you know you have people that actually know what they're talking about like a nick campbell at grayscale gorilla who actually has a photography background and like actually knows how you know rim lights and all the different lighting setups work but then you also have a lot of people that were just kind of regurgitating what nick was saying and acting like they knew and they weren't actually teaching the right way and so once i mm-hmm. discovered that you know what if i want to learn lighting I I shouldn't be searching for how to light in X software, Mm. like Blender Mm. or Cinema, whatever it is. I should just be looking at how do I light? And you'll find out Mm. all these studio photographers that are actually teaching you like the the concepts, the raw concepts from the real world that people translate to the digital world, but you're seeing it firsthand and why things work the way they do. Like, you know, it was only until like a few years ago that I was like, oh, you can have a bounce card that's just a plain object in your scene and it bounces light. And actually, it creates more realistic lighting without having to have a second light that's casting shadows and, you know, just all these different things and negative lighting and just all this kind of stuff. And then, and then not even to mention like all the cinematography concepts that you can understand just by you know, Googling how, what, what makes good cinematography and Mm -hmm. even like, uh, I'm trying to get into what makes better like edits and how do you cut and like what type of, of footage should you shoot? Like me, like wide shots and then medium shots and then close ups and abstract. And, and it's just all these things where once you, once you learn about them and are made aware of them, because a lot of it for me was like, I was just not aware of all this knowledge that, you know, makes up cinematography and stuff like that. And once you learn it and you watch a game of Thrones intro or whatever elastic is doing these days, like, cause they're just the masters that you look at and you're like, Oh, that's why this shot follows this shot. Or this is why things are lit this way. And I always say it's like seeing the mate, the code in the matrix and it just, everything Mm -hmm. starts to make sense. And, and then you can start applying that to your own work. And so that, that's been the biggest thing for me is just learning cinematography, learning lighting, not in a software, but just learning in a real world situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say on top of that, like even go like, you know, because I went to university, but you don't have to do that. Right. Like there's a bunch of meetups all the time, no matter what country you're in. There's always meetups, especially with like photographers or if there's like a community college. I know at least here in the state, like you could take like a class for maybe like 15 or 20 bucks. So I would say instead of um, like looking it up on YouTube, I would actually go out and find a group that's actually doing it and just join that group or take that one class. Because I think being in the field is exponentially more helpful than just staying behind your computer. I was actually about to ask this question that now we, we are talking about learning. Do you guys recommend people to go to uni and learn this in a in a more traditional way or now the best way is now going to on YouTube or read some books, attend a workshop like Jonathan mentioned, and then go through that route? Because sometimes I think the university degrees might not be updated, especially with the speed of not with the, the yeah. updates that <laughs> are coming in with 3D <laughs> softwares. No, they're not. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I think the workshops are the most valuable. I think because we need peer-to-peer interaction, right? Mm -hmm. Even though as artists, a lot of times we're introverts, but once you get around like-minded people, then you find that everybody just opens up. Everybody wants to help each other. And I think that's the best way to grow. So I would even say like, if you're super introverted and you're just used to looking stuff up on YouTube, like get outside your comfort zone, go find a workshop, go find maybe like a support group and just go out there and join a group because you'll, for one, you'll build friendships and then two there's a good networking opportunities because you know you're around like-minded people so maybe a photographer or a lighter that you might come in touch with maybe they need a motion graphics artist for a project that they come on so you know you just never know what's going to happen when you go out there and actually meet people face to face yeah and i mean 
we're, we're lucky in that, you know, I'm in Denver, Winbush is in the LA area, and, and you guys are in Vancouver now, at least I think yeah. you are. You guys are the no, globe we'll be going back in summer. We'll be yeah, going okay. back in summer. So okay. we'll be closing summer, yeah. yes. Gotcha. But I mean, that, like, uh, that's the whole thing about school of motion is that not everyone has access to being close to a good university or can even afford it. Mm. And that's why our thing is yes, you come on, you, you, you join a, a class. And you learn online, but the other big thing that we do, and what I'm, why I'm such a huge fan of School of Motion, why I started working there to begin with, is the whole community aspect, the TA teaching assistant aspect, where you're not just learning in a vacuum. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people can make is they'll just digest all these YouTube tutorials and then just be creating in a vacuum, and you, you don't have anyone there to give you feedback and say like, mm -hmm. actually, you know, the, the, you should like this. This way or I don't get what you did there and that's one of the biggest ways you can get gro uh, experience exponential growth is having someone that is experienced that is a teaching assistant or is someone that works in your studio whether that remotely or in person that can that can be that peer and be that uh, that little shoulder to, to kind of lean on to help you and guide you to the right direction. Because it's kind of like, I always use the analogy of like, if you want to learn how to golf, like you can't just go out, buy some clubs and go onto a golf course and start swinging away. And you, you're like, I can't hit the ball very hard. And you're like, well, I'll watch a tutorial on it. And I'm like, okay, I think I got my hips right. But no, if you actually have someone there, that's like, no, 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 you need to stand like this. And you need to go like that and see what you're doing here. You need to like you're going to learn how to golf much faster. So mm -hmm. that that feedback is 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 so huge and why you know why it's why we do it at School of Motion. We have the community, mm -hmm. we have feedback. So you're not just creating and posting work in a vacuum. That is extremely accurate. I use the esports example because I used to be in esports, and when you look at the top tier esports players. Right after they finish a game of Dota or League of Legends, they're in the room talking about why they made the plays, why they failed and why they succeeded. If the feedback's not there, they're going back and doing the exact same moves over and over again. So they're never, they're never going to learn. They might come up with some lucky plays, but they're not going to learn quickly. So practicing makes perfect, yes, when it comes to using the software. But when you're talking about fundamentals, practice does not make perfect. You can learn the wrong thing. If you practice the wrong thing, keep yeah. practicing the wrong thing. You will do it forever. Yeah. Yeah, you're swinging a club a thousand times the wrong way. That doesn't help. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So that's why when you talk about things like lighting, color theory, all these things, you can be lighting the wrong way every single day. And you're thinking you're practicing, but you're actually not. Which is why I go back to the point of recreating a scene. Because if you like a certain movie uh, that has won Academy Awards, for instance, for cinematography, and you go and recreate that scene, you're recreating a really good lighting setup, you're recreating a good composition, you're recreating all of that, so you, you, get, you get your eyes used to that. That's why I think that's really powerful. When it comes to peer-to-peer, -to -peer, I didn't have that environment, unfortunately, but the moment you guys start talking about that environment of having a peer-to-peer -peer action when it comes to learning 3D, it sounds wonderful, and it sounds like the, the quickest way to get there. Uh, of course, you guys do a lot of tours as well, and, and we've seen that, that you guys do the tours together. All over the world. All over the world, and you guys definitely have to do one in the, in the UAE. We have to talk about that, but aside from people coming there to learn, do you guys also have people sometimes connecting with each other and working on different projects? I just want to share that with people so that people know that there's more than just learning. Actual work opportunities could happen. That's, that's my question. Yeah, I mean, I know EJ and I, we know so many artists that, you know, they come to these different events and, you know, they link up with different studio heads. And next thing you know, they have a full time position working oh. at, you know, A, B and C. So these events, they are good networking opportunities. They are good opportunities mm -hmm. to meet fellow peers and, you know, just like I said, have that human interaction. And if you don't have it in your area, like you can always start one up. Like I know you guys did one out there in Dubai, like mm -hmm. as soon as you guys got there, right? Like you guys had to meet up with a bunch of people there. Yes. I know um, EJ, he didn't have a meetup out there in Denver, so he started up his own. So there's always opportunities there because you, you know, like if nothing's organized and you organize it yourself, you'll realize how many artists there are around you and you know mm -hmm. you just start building your fellowship up that way mm -hmm. how did you uh, actually that's very interesting thanks jonathan ej how did you start yours so i i you know i moved to denver eight years ago and maxon actually did a, a their kind of road show back then mm -hmm. and uh i 
I had had the luck of of being able to present at it, and I was I was looking into Denver as a place to to uh, to uh, move to, and they did this meetup, this Maxon meetup, and like a hundred and something people showed up, and I was like. Wow, like I knew a few artists out here, but I didn't know there was this much. And to a T, every single person I talked to was like, I didn't know that there was a hundred artists here, let alone a hundred artists that were interested in like Cinema 4D. And so when I went for my presentation, I was like, I was like, hey, like I I heard that everyone was very shocked by the amount of artists that were here. Is there like a meetup that's going on at all? And everyone's like, no, I was like, okay, well right now I'm making one, follow me on Facebook wow. and uh, <laughs> let's get this started. And so, you know, I, I was lucky in that I had a platform to promote it and I had that ready made audience and we do it where, and it's not, it's not massive. Like we probably get, you know, 30, to 50 people at any given time so it's it's pretty small it's kind of punk rock we're in the back of a brewery the like beer tanks are around us but it's kind of like a cool <laughs> chill vibe uh when uh, winbush hasn't been to one yet but uh we gotta we gotta oh change God, that the brewery, actually right? everyone's got it yeah. yeah everyone come on out but uh yeah, we, yeah, gotta, we, we gotta do it, do it. We gotta do it. it. yeah we gotta yeah, do yeah. the <laughs> world tour here the bad yes. decisions yeah. tour come make oh, bad yeah, decisions all good. across the world <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that was the big thing. And the one story I always tell people is Chris Schmidt, uh, Rocket Lasso, who does a lot of Cinema 4D tutorials, used to work at Grayscale Gorilla. He started up the Chicago Motion Graphics uh, group. And we all know Chicago to be this like huge mecca of like motion design meetups and it's it was always this big community that i when i was learning cinema 4d i always looked to chicago like i think i need to move there because the community looks <laughs> so cool and uh chris told me the story about how he started his meetup and he's like i put it online and i sh we did it at a coffee shop and he's like one other person showed up <laughs> and, he, and so it was like okay well i guess this is the meetup but then that one person told a couple of his friends those friends told other and now it's like you know it, it's grown throughout the years to be this massive thing and now they have half res and half res was the direct result of chris meeting up with that one person at, at that first meetup and growing from there. So that's why I always say like, if you find just one other person that wants to grab a coffee or two other people, like just go do it and you never know what may come of it. Wow. Yeah. We just had a local meetup startup with, um, unreal artist actually last month up in Pasadena, California. And then I presented at the last one, which was just this past Saturday and um, this was only the second one that was held, and we actually sold out the event. So it was 100 wow. people. And we didn't even know there was 100 Unreal artists. Like, it's not even game artists. It was actual, like, designers that were interested in Unreal. So, again, it's like you just put the word out there. You just never know who's around you because once, you know, I put it out there on LinkedIn, like, hey, I'm presenting at this um, event on Saturday. Tickets sold out immediately. Everybody came in. I'm just like, holy crap. I didn't realize there's so many people, you know, like in Pasadena alone, which was crazy. It's like Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come, you know? Like, yeah. right. you got to do it and see what, what happens. Like, at the end of the day, what do you... Yeah. And one of the one of the things I would say that hung me up on it was like, oh, I got to find some really cool venue and pay for it or something like that. It's like, no. Like, mm -hmm. if there's an arts district in your community, there's, there's a lot of places that'll host you for free if they know that you're in the creative space or it, doing in the arts. Or, like you said, just like go to a coffee shop and just do a little informal thing at, at first and just kind of hang out. Like, it doesn't have to we be... Starbucks. Yeah, we yeah. did in Starbucks, Starbucks as well. Yeah. I mean, it yeah, was there nothing you go. official. Yeah. 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 We expected one person. Yeah. And then eight to ten people <laughs> showed up. Exactly like what you guys mentioned. But even if what you said was really strong, because if one person showed up, I'd probably be like, oh shit, that's going to be awkward. But the fact that you say their one started with one person as well, and then it grew to be so big, it just goes to show that you just have to do it. The we Nike all, motto, but you just have to do it. You just we do it. I have the problem. You're, it's two of us all the time. Ah, yeah, there's so two of us. Yeah, yeah, you're never gonna go and no one will show up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> one person yeah. showed up at the meetup, <laughs> but that that that's crazy, man. I I think that's really powerful because so we we come from uh, prior to Canada, we were actually in Asia, and I believe that if you were to hold a meetup in Asia, you probably in Malaysia specifically where I was at, you probably wouldn't get as many attendees. Maybe. maybe Maybe about one as well, maybe one or two, if you're just starting out. 
because I think in the U.S. you probably have more people who are involved in these different communities. They're used to seeing these pop-ups. But when it comes to Malaysia, I don't think there was a lot. But it's very motivating that you say that even if one person shows up, so no matter where you're in the world, even if you think there's no artists around you, just you can, yeah. try. If, if you feel alone in your field and you feel like you want to meet more people like yourself and online doesn't do it justice for some reason for you, just try to have one person meet you for coffee that might be interested. I think that's really, really powerful. Yeah, I think these days with, you know, all the, like, especially, you know, I, I was doom scrolling with everyone else when the Sora stuff came out and there was some Sora Ooh. stuff that came out yesterday, wow. right? And, and, and I think just there's so many people that has, uh, that have this anxiety that are just kind of like, uh, you know, super, they like, feel super isolated. Like we're in a, we're in like a loneliness epidemic, like study after study after study says that we are more connected than ever, but for some reason we just feel lonelier than ever. And I think these types of like when Winbush and I were on this tour, like you just saw it in the, in the, every community we went to some communities never even had a meetup. They've, you know, a lot of these people have never been to a meetup before. And so it was one of these things where it's like, okay, well now if we do these in the future, like we want to make sure that we connect with the local people to make it. So it's not just this once a year or once a decade thing that we can go there, promote the hell out of it and kind of pass that ball on to someone that's local and can keep that, keep that going throughout throughout the year and have a lot more meetups that are that are just made up of the local community there. And so I think that's going to be more and more important as we as we kind of go on there as we as we feel more isolated as we're more online all the time and and yeah. you know I just think coming out of the pandemic I think we're still like we're kind of clear of it for the most part but I think there's a lot of residual stuff yes. that's that's happening and we just haven't got back to normal yet and i think judging mm -hmm. by you know the, all the meetups that are happening now people are craving that connection uh because connections mm -hmm. that huge thing that i think everyone is is really is really striving for and i think it's going to be that human connection especially yeah. is going to be yeah. even more mm -hmm. important as everything seemingly gets taken over by robots <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Speaking of which, you just <laughs> mentioned Sora. That was one of the most important topics that we wanted mm. to talk about it today. Yeah. So the, f let's start with the first just, reaction. Just, just okay. one question. Jonathan, you've seen the videos too, of right? Course. Before we get started. Of okay, course. all right. Everyone's yeah. seen it. Yeah, it was actually just in Forbes this morning. So yeah, I actually read the Forbes article on it because they just collaborated. Actually, we know one of the collaborators, Don Allen, that um, was one of the mm. people that they hooked up with to put these videos out. So yeah, ready for it. <laughs> okay, all right. So Farah, yeah. just before anybody starts talking, if you're watching or listening right now, if you haven't seen any of the Sora videos, first of all, what are you doing? What are you, are you doing? <laughs> you can pause this for a moment and just search for Sora because it will blow your mind. Um, I think you need to be aware of this if you're an artist. But Farah, please, uh, please go ahead. So let's talk about the first impression because I think what we watched yesterday was the collaboration between a few artists and OpenAI creating different videos, but it was, I think a few weeks ago, that was the first release of the videos were out. What was the first thing that came into your mind when you watched the Sora AI video? It's cool. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, <laughs> honestly, like, I mean, like I'm probably dating myself, but I feel like we go through this a lot. Like something comes out, makes a big splash, everybody gets hyperactive and then it kind of just mellows out there for a little bit, right? Like I remember when Fiverr was a big thing and everybody thought the sky was falling with Fiverr, right? Like, oh man, these cheap artists are gonna take away all of our jobs and that didn't happen, right? And then same thing, even with Unreal, I felt it like whenever I did my first Unreal tutorial, like, hey, here's real time, all the offline people kind of got scared, like, oh, I don't want to learn this new thing. And then it mellowed out, right? Like, so mm -hmm. these things kind of, you know, hit their peaks and valleys, but you know, it's just another tool that we could use at our disposal. And plus, like I saw something about, I think they met with like Hollywood execs. It might be behind like a paywall or a closed door type thing. So I wouldn't get up in arms just yet because I don't think the technology is going to be just for like anybody to jump into. Like, I think you're going to have to be in the business to be able to have even access to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say about the whole, I mean, it, it, the one thing you saw is any tool in the hands of any artist that has 
good taste and has a vision and is really great at storytelling, of course, they're going to make amazing stuff no matter what it is. And that's the thing is that, you know, everyone has access to a camera, but not everyone's creating amazing photography or creating, you know, telling these, you know, uh, uh, life-changing epic stories with their phone so just mm-hmm. access to the tool doesn't make you access to a, a, a camera doesn't make you a photographer you know you're just someone that has a camera so just because you have access to ai you have access to sora does not make you an ai artist or an artist of any kind like that's ridiculous mm-hmm. to say that just because i have access to something that makes me uh, proficient like i have a wrench does that make me a plumber? No, I, I'm a, just an idiot with a with a wrench that doesn't know anything <laughs> about plumbing. Um, and so that's the thing that I always w- try to calm myself down with is that AI is going to be most effective in the hands of artists that can tell good stories, that have the ideas. I think we're going to move into I – mean, we already kind of have an idea economy. I think it's going to be even more so. And I think if you're a technician – I think if unless you go into learn all the stable diffusion technical stuff, like I think it's it's going to be really everything's going to be taken over by people who can tell stories that have a great eye, uh, that were probably probably already making awesome stuff before AI, and will continue to you know create awesome stories with AI. Yeah, there that is, is one a- comment I saw Sorry? on the original Sora. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. saying there is one comment that I saw on Twitter. When the original Sora's videos came out, there was a person in there that said, oh, I'm going to use this to recreate endings for Game of Thrones that I want to see. And I was like, at that point, I'm like, okay, we're fine. Because for one, this person is not creative. Like, if you're a true creative, then you would be thinking, how do I make the next Game of Thrones? Not take something that's already there and recreate it into something that I want to see. So those type of comments there from, like, not creative people, I'm like... We're going to be okay. Like everybody has access to this stuff, but not everybody's going to be able to make original compelling um, content with it. One, mm-hmm. one other one other comment that I heard was like, it's it's equivalent. Like if you made something with AI, it's equivalent to like telling someone your dream. And it's like, okay, cool story, bro. Like I don't. I don't care what your dream was. Like I had a weird dream too. Like, uh, or like your fantasy football team. Like, I don't care how your fantasy football team went. Like I have one too. I don't want to hear. You don't want to hear about mine. I don't want to hear about yours. Mm, No, absolutely true. When you guys talk about the fact that just because you have access to the tool doesn't make you an artist. When mid journey came out, I freaked out. I, I looked at it and I remember looking at how good it was. And I was like, okay, we're, we're done. At least 3d renders, photos, they're going to be done with AI. And then after a while, I've, I think over the past year, I've subscribed and unsubscribed to Midjourney at least five times because I subscribed and I thought I'm going to use it. Then I typed in my prompt and I realized but, uh, I cannot get, get what it. I want. So I, I go and create it myself. So unless you're using that every single day and you're just this pro at text prompts, that's like what you're doing on a daily basis. Just like how we spend time in our 3D softwares, this is what you're doing for a living. Then I think you can come up with amazing photos, amazing results. But if you think you can just have access to these tools and create something beautiful in a day, I don't think that's possible because you need to be so great at English and also so amazing at conveying what you see in your mind. Plus, we that's talked about this itself, with right? Nick. Yes, and we talked about this with Ren or Nick, I believe, where sometimes I don't even know what I want to create. I need to get into the 3D software, mess around with everything in that software, and then figure out what it is I'm trying to get to. I don't have the perfect image in my mind that I can just describe to an AI and have it be ready. So I think these things are there for sure. But at the same time, it's it's scary to see what Sora is capable of but seeing. But the quality change that we see from, from runway, runway to, to open Sora AI. And it, in, in the matter of the last time that you guys were on the podcast, I think we, it was the beginning of mid journey getting really good quality yeah. images. And now one year down the road, the Sora videos are really, really good. Some of them, they create perfect shadows, yes. reflections. Reflections. And it's weird because like, I don't know if you guys saw that train video where the train goes into a tunnel and then you see the girl's reflection in the glass. And I'm, yeah. I'm thinking, how did it even think about that? Because it's using noise. It's using noise, Gaussian noise to create these images and then put them into a video. It just feels kind of surreal, but it, again, it's scary, but also cool to see that these things are happening at the same time. I, it's it's wonderful at the same time, but scary. Well, that's that's my way of describing it. It's like the it. the one thing that I thought was kind of interesting was the whole balloon head guy. 
So I was like, that's a that's an interesting story. That's an interesting character and an interesting story that's being told because it's got the voiceover too. And I think that's the mm. thing. It's like, can you tell good stories, compelling stories with with these visuals? Because at the end of the day, like, I mean, if you had a bunch of crappy stock footage, could you tell that same mm. story? I don't know. And I think that's where some of the, the Sora stuff gets to. It's just like kind of weird kind of like very not exciting b-roll footage that you're trying mm-hmm. i mean it looks cool but standalone mm-hmm. it's just a bunch of like stock of stock mm-hmm. videos and so there's some mm-hmm. people out there that you know give them a bunch of footage like an editor and they they can tell a great story and weave a story through all that edit but i think what a lot of people are doing is is and i, I heard this this term a while ago was like people are just painting with the color that they squish out of the tube like they're not doing anything with it they're not mixing it with other colors and seeing what else they can come up with it's just this is what i got yeah and you're not doing anything creative with it yeah i think behind the hands of like a real visionary it's going to be powerful but just for your everyday user i mean like you said it's just like giving a kid a box of crayons and saying go color and they're just like you know, scribbling mm, yeah. all over the place. Yeah. I, th- I think the other place that I think we recently saw an AI advancement was Adobe Substance Painter bringing yes. AI as a yeah. tool. I think those could be really powerful to the artists. I don't know how good they are. I haven't tested it myself. I don't think it's out yet. I think it's... I, I saw it out yet. I the saw a video on Twitter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that, that sounds interesting to me. And that was, you know... <laughs> The, the immediate re- reaction to anything AI from artists is usually like, this sucks, Adobe, you suck. Yeah. Uh, and I was yeah. just like, wait a minute. Like, this is like, a, a, in, you know, whatever the, I, I'm on the, under the assumption that Adobe Firefly, like they source everything from the Adobe stock and every artist signed off or opted in or whatever. I don't know about that aspect of things. But mm. that aside, the the whole point of the text to texture thing is like doesn't this actually help the artist job like this yes. yeah. doesn't like put any artist out of a, another job unless you're purely a a texture artist which i think mm. a lot of us would never hire a texture artist anyway so we're not removing mm. those jobs like um mm. and so i was like i was just like i don't see how this is bad necessarily and yes. some people were like well this this totally negates me learning substance designer and i'm like okay so like do you really need another app to learn like who cares like i would i would (laughs) love to waste have wasted my time learning stupid body paint that's like not great at uvs to never learn that again like and it's just these weird reactions people have and it's like no axing a software from your tool set because ai helps you do it much better that's good for you Mm -hmm. like that saves you time yes i mean if you just remove the word ai out of it and just make it so that it was part of the software everyone would be fine with it an update it's just it's just an updated feature and i think it's it's extremely helpful because even if you are a texture artist now you can go and learn something new because Mm -hmm. this part of your workflow is 10 times faster and sometimes you couldn't even find some of these textures or, or or materials and now you have them in a second I think it was pretty awesome, honestly, when I saw the update. Yeah, so backstory on a lot of what Adobe does, excuse me, they've been experimenting with this stuff for a very, very long time. Like I've seen early machine learning stuff even like a decade back. And so like they used to have this thing called Project Alchemist in which you would take a photo of a texture, let's say like a ground or something, and then you would run it through the algorithm and it would actually, you know, like make a finer detailed one or you can, you know, reshape or manipulate it. Like this was maybe like eight years ago. So technically they could have threw AI on it, you know, say like Project Alchemist AI and it would have been the same thing, right? But nobody cared back then because AI wasn't such like a, a hot word at the moment. So like this text to texture thing, this is just the evolution of what was happening 
happening eight years ago. And so it's not replacing Substance Designer, just like how Alchemist was. This is actually, you could use it within Substance Designer. So if you need like a good starting off point, instead of taking a picture of a ground texture, you could just type in muddy ground texture, and then you have your starting off point. And then from there, you could continue to manipulate it just how you would inside a Substance Designer. So that's why, like I even tweeted about it. I'm like, why is everybody going nuts about this? Like this only makes it easier for you to jump into texture design even faster and gives you a lot more options. Like you guys said, not everybody has access to certain textures. So they wouldn't be able to take a photograph of certain textures that they might need, like snow or sand or something like that. Mm -hmm. So now they could get a good starting point go from there and you can still design it the way that you want but we're living in you know like an online society to where if you say anything ai people immediately <laughs> jump at it without even yeah. like really sitting Wait, back and just realizing dude, like what is exactly going on here jonathan you know what's the funny thing when it comes to the artist world yes people are hating on the world ai but i feel like anything outside if you add the word ai you're gonna it's sell cool, more yeah. i i realize in dubai when we go now anything samsung there's like galaxy with ai it's like they're, they're yeah. trying to shove ai into everything vacuum cleaner yeah, with AI. AI, and people will buy it <laughs> but when it comes to artists they're like don't don't use the word ai anymore it's it's so funny we were we were talking with faraz and i asked him if you could have one AI tool that helps you with your workflow that is not out there, maybe it's out there. You but can you know create it yourself for your workflow. What yeah. would you What would you do? Farah's answer was, I would create a rigging tool that helps me auto rig everything that yes, I have. Yes, just bipeds, whales, giraffes, just anything. I just give it the mesh and it rigs it perfectly, Waiting. and it's ready there for me to use. Yeah. What UV about you guys? Thing. What would you choose? Yeah, I would agree with that one. Yeah. If I if I could have someone yeah. that UV unwraps everything, that rigs something automatically, automatically weights everything, and that's the whole thing yeah. is why I'm I'm fine with AI because again, it's 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 treated as a new feature that helps your workflow. Guess what? I love character animation and, and character stuff. I don't like rigging at all. I hate it. No. I hate weight painting. <laughs> I hate that aspect of it. It slows me down from doing the fun mm. animation part of it, which is mm -hmm. what I love to do. So. Yes, give me things that help me f spend more time on the things that I love to do. So the, I, I agree. I'd love the the rigging stuff. But the okay, thing is, we're gonna, stuff is we're gonna not... do this together. We're gonna make Let's a company. Make something happen. All right, me and you, we're gonna <laughs> we're make gonna... this AI thing work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. But Jonathan, the thing what, is, what is like. Create? It, this stuff isn't new, right? Like you guys are talking about, you know, the rigging. I mean, Mixamo has been around forever, right? Mm -hmm. So think about like if Mixamo came out today people will automatically assume that this is some type of AI generated rigging tool, which, you know, it's been around since like beginning of like whatever I started doing this stuff. Like it's been around forever. And I was going to even say like rotoscoping, like being able to just select something and have it automatically be cut out. But again, that's technology that's been there for a long time. Like you have Adobe um, Roto Brush, you know, it's not exactly um, 100%, but it's been getting better over time. And these are the type of things it's like back then they used to call it machine learning, right? They didn't call it AI. AI became the hot word when mid journey came out, but it's like all this stuff has been there and we've all been using it for a very long time. So I just find it weird that artists are just like jumping, you know, at anything that has AI attached to it, because it's like, mm. I guarantee every artist has used Mixamo at one point. Every artist yes. has used Rotobrush <laughs> yeah. at one point. <laughs> Even in the um, audio design world, like I do music on the side just for fun. There's mm -hmm. a mastering program or plugin. I can't remember the name of it, but it automatically will master your track for you. And it's been around forever. And just recently with this last update, they added AI to the end of it. All the audio engineers are going nuts now. And it's like, you guys have been using this, but now that they threw AI at the end of it, now everybody has a problem with this. So it's just, it's a really weird um, thing that we're in right now. What would you, Jonathan, what would you want to have if you could create an AI tool that could help any part of your workflow? What would you have? Um, funny enough, like not even just on the art workflow part, but like maybe doing some of the translation for the tutorials that I'm doing, mm -hmm. because there's a big audience out there that, you know, we've been traveling a lot and they might not be familiar with my YouTube channel because they don't speak English. Right. That's my first language. That's what I do mm -hmm. my tutorials in. So it'd be cool to have AI retranslate my stuff into like Mandarin or Cantonese mm -hmm. or Portuguese mm -hmm. or, you know, Korean, like all the Korean. different stuff you guys out there. To Korea, so. I saw, yeah. 
we went to Korea last year, yeah, and we had to actually have a translator translate whenever we're speaking on stage. So it'd be cool to use AI for, you know, being able to expand our audience and just show people how to use these programs that we're teaching. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I believe there is an AI tool when it comes to translation. I think YouTube YouTube is already implementing uh, AI dub for for certain channels. I think Mr. Beast now you can watch Mr. Yep. Beast in yeah. in Tamil, in Chinese, in Brazilian. That's why he stopped his Mr. Beast India, Mr. Beast Brazil channels as well. But there was I don't know if you guys saw the software. There was one specific software that translates real using time. yeah it, no, no, using, it no, 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 it's time, not real time. Yeah. It's using your own voice. And it's basically yeah. changing that to different languages. I don't know if you guys saw that. Yeah, I've spoke to a few companies um, last year that were doing that. So I might start experimenting with that. And the cool thing is it not only changes your voice, it will change your mouth structure so that it looks like you're speaking in that dialect. So like if they took me and made my tutorial speaking Spanish, it would make my mouth move to make it look like I was actually speaking Spanish, which is next level. Like I thought that was really dope. Yeah, no, 100%. I think the AI translation thing is definitely happening. Again, I already saw the video, but having that added to YouTube would be the coolest thing. So it's automatic. It's Jonathan speaking in 10, 20 different languages. And it's also your own mouth yeah. that is moving accurately to that. I definitely think that's a cool one. You know, one conversation that me and Faraz, there are two hot topics that we always discuss. One is AI. One is the future of social media and we always talk about whether any of these UGCs we have Fortnite we have Roblox can take over in the future in a place that you go to Fortnite not only to play but to hang out with your friends of course we have now concerts in Fortnite we had Travis Scott I think recently Lady Gaga Eminem was doing festivals we would love to hear what do you guys think about the future of Fortnite especially Jonathan I think you created a Fortnite map as well you've been going strong in UEFN yeah, that's been my latest passion, right? Because like before I even started motion graphics, I wanted to work in game design. I just got turned down by the university. So full circle, it's like now I'm out here creating games. But funny, you had mentioned the um, the concert stuff because I'm actually working on a concert with Mixmaster Mike from the Beastie Boys that are, mm -hmm. it's going to be the first non-Epic Games created concert inside of UEFN. So excited about re uh, releasing that this summer. Then I have the side-scrolling game that I've been working on with Methamine in there inside of UEFN. I got to give a big shout out to Haas because he's the one that really helped me get that extra push that I needed to just go in there and start experimenting and having fun with it because a lot of people, when they hear a video game, they think like you have to be a programmer or a higher programmer or, you know, they think there's this barrier to entry. But with like UEFN, like especially for us, it's like we know Unreal Engine already. So everything directly translate. And then the way that I've been operating is I'm using the sequencer to do a lot of stuff that you typically have to program. And so it's like I'm so adapt to using the sequencer and Unreal. I'm able to bypass any scripting language and I'm able to just kind of brute force the game that I want it to be. So it's been a cool experiment and a cool journey in there, but I definitely think there's a big future for interactive experiences. And a lot of brands are really interested in that type of stuff too. I mean, UEFN seems so cool. The I'm just gonna go ahead and before we get into the creatives and technicalities for anybody watching and listening that thinks maybe that UEFN is not the right place to be, they just announced in the latest State of Unreal that more than $320 million was paid out to creators since last year, One year when only. UFN was launched, which is nuts. I mean, the top 10, if you look at the amount of money the top 10 creators have made, and again, I'm not saying you're going to get in there, you're going to create a map and everyone's going to play and you're going to get a million dollar, but I'm just saying this is like the early YouTube days where people were creating content and then everyone was like, ah, it's just YouTubers. But then they realized how much they're making and they said, oh, I want to give this YouTube thing a try. So when it comes to Fortnite, there's definitely a huge push coming from Epic Games. There's a reason why, I mean, me and Farah talk about it sometimes. We're like, there's, there's a reason why Tim Sweeney's pushing Fortnite so much. There must be a big belief in the future of where this is going to be. And I mean, bringing in Lego itself, because we, I used to play Roblox as well with, uh, when I was in esports, I used to play Roblox with some of my audience and it was a really fun game. But the fact that Fortnite just brought in, Ro uh, brought in Lego into, into their entire ecosystem is like, they're trying to take down everybody and they're gonna, they're gonna win because Lego is such a, a huge brand and the game looks like Roblox now, 
but you now yep. have assets that you can use as well from the Lego world. It just feels like they're definitely creating that giant ecosystem and allowing anybody to come in and create anything. Plus, they got the new cameras. They got the first person camera, uh, cameras from the side, cameras from the top down view. You can now meta much, humans can go meta humans go in there. They're making clothing much easier. I remember we created this thing with meta humans with clothes, and it, it's such a pain. And now they're partnering with Marvelous Designer, giving free license yep. to creators to go out and bring clothes to meta, for meta humans. It's just like. They're making it so easy for anybody to just get in UEFN and create something. Uh, EJ, you've seen this stuff as well. How do you feel about this? I mean, when you talk about, you know, someone like me, I don't play Fortnite. I'm an old, you know, so I don't do any of that. But <laughs> I can see where this is going. You know, when when didn't just, you know, a, a month or so ago, Disney announced they invested a whole bunch of money with yes. Epic and Fortnite and all that stuff. One, and I was four, like, okay, that makes billion. sense. Like, there's people from all around the world. Like, Disney World's only getting more expensive to physically go to. Imagine if you put on your headset and you can ride any of the rides and Disney gets a cut of all that stuff. And however they split that up, I was like, that's a cash cow waiting to happen you know whatever disney mm -hmm. does in that space and you can virtually go to a disney world or a disney metaverse or whatever you want to call it so i i get it for mm -hmm. for brands and stuff like that and like i said with the with the stuff with the rive and all that other stuff it's just cr creating another media for artists to create in and hopefully make money from so i'm i'm all for al mm -hmm. any of these technologies that kind of uh, bring down that technical barrier for an artist like myself mm. that doesn't know how to program games very well but you know Winbush he's not necessarily a game designer himself but he's he's kicking but I saw what he's been making so far and uh, I think that's very mm. empowering for for artists yeah I'm a you know, big we... proponent of um just making several different revenue sources for yourself and I always tell artists, you know, like we're in a slow period right now, right? In Hollywood, at least, like we're dealing with the strikes. We're still dealing with the repercussions from that. So work's been slow. But I tell people all the time, I'm like, you have other opportunities to make money for yourself. Like, you know, Fortnite, they give out $320 million in payouts. Of course, not everybody's going to make a ton of money, just like NFTs. You know, it's like you could go into it. Don't think you're going to get rich, but you might make something right. So you never know unless you go out there and do it. And it's not just about making, you know, like shooters or combat sports stuff. Like there is somebody that rebuilt museums inside of UEFN. So if you can't go to a particular museum, you could go to it virtually inside of Fortnite and, you know, be there with a bunch of your friends and just explore the museum. So there's a lot of opportunities there. And then you can also pitch it to some of your clients. So like you guys were mentioning Samsung earlier, like if Samsung is a client, you could say like, hey, why don't we build Samsung World right inside of UEFN? Because they have a million concurrent players a day that are in there. Plus, we could generate some revenue on the side. So there's a lot of opportunities there for artists to just make some side income. Dude, that is... You, very, you were going to say yeah, the same yeah, thing. It's yeah, it's very <laughs> accurate. What you, what you just explained happened to us. So yes. we were talking to a partner here in UAE and we were proposing different services and we were talking about different products. And during the meeting, we just mentioned One the slide. word Fortnite. And the moment we mentioned, the, oh, Fortnite, we can create in Fortnite. And then <laughs> we ended up yeah. creating a custom map for that brand in Fortnite nice. because... The audience that you can get in Fortnite and the games like Fortnite, you cannot get them anywhere. And recently in November, they broke the records of 100 million users. Yeah, yeah. Of course, those are mostly going to the Epic Games map themselves, but it's impossible to create a game nowadays and have that initial community ready for you to at least try it one time. And it, I feel like if you are listening and watching and if you know Unreal Engine, this feels like a no brainer because it's the, almost the exact same software. You take the same assets, you're using the same tools, and plus you're gonna get a lot more, you, you're gonna get access to Lego and all these different assets which are already Rocket there. Rocket League as well, right? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know if the Rocket, yeah, League, Rocket League assets are there. And, are there um, available to use in UFN now? Yeah, you can build out racing maps now, which that's something I'm going to be doing here as well. So you have Rocket League in there. You have um, Rock Band in there with the festival stuff, with the music side, like you said, mm -hmm. Lego. And then there's a lot more coming, especially on a Disney side of thing. Like they have mm -hmm. car blanche to the entire Disney library now. So that's mm -hmm. your Star Wars, that's your Marvel, that's your mm -hmm. Disney princesses. Um, what is that? National Geographic, like everything that's under that Disney umbrella. It's going to be up for grabs pretty soon. So it's really exciting. 
Do, do you guys think that it would turn out to become a non-game platform? So now you mentioned yeah. there are a museum, so we will have exhibitions, we will have car shows, we will have property shows. Do you think in the future, in the future we can have ecosystem in place for Fortnite or Roblox where people actually hang out and spend time like the metaverse gaming. yeah exactly yeah so um fun fact like the coding language inside the UEFN is called verse and that is because of metaverse right so metaverse mm. verse you know it could lie so yeah. Tim Sweeney is actually looking at this as being like ready player one right like he's putting all these pieces together you have the player bases there I mean they're not calling it the metaverse but you know it's it's edging into that direction. So they're making some really smart plays over there. I think the closest thing, because I remember in the, in the NFT phase, everybody wanted to create that metaverse. And it was, it was a, an amazing vision because people wanted to have this space to hang out, especially as EJ mentioned during COVID, people were craving for that. This seemed like what people wanted to have. Well, every through. project would come like, we build the metaverse. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, it worked. Just yeah. like the AI term, you know, <laughs> yeah. you add the term AI to it, you can sell more. So metaverse was the thing at the time. And I, and again, I understand why, but I feel like the closest thing we could have to a metaverse is going to be Roblox or Fortnite. But again, the moves that, although I, I did truly enjoy Roblox, but the moves that Fortnite is making, Roblox is nowhere near close. I mean, in terms of graphics capabilities is definitely higher, but also at the, yeah. at the same time, the fact that you can create with Unreal. And the, the, they even announced that by 2025, their internal team will also be releasing the Battle Royales using UEFN. So they're just merging yeah. and battle testing everything together, which goes to show their dedication to this entire thing. EJ, but do you think that the idea of metaverse could happen. And if it does, will it be Fortnite? I mean, I think AR and VR has got to take off first for that to even happen. And I think I think you mentioned it before. I think that just the technology is not there yet. I mean, you saw with the Apple mm. Vision Pro, people like, you know, got into it and they're like, actually, this kind of sucks. I'm not going to wear this all day. <laughs> and, you know, right. and, yeah. I know. Did you guys try it? I haven't even, I, I haven't, haven't tried, tried it. Tried, I mean, I've tried VR headsets no, before. I'm yet. not a fan of having something mm. bulky that's plugged in on my face and until they have something that's like a Ray-Ban sunglasses that looks cool. Yeah, sunglasses, you yeah. don't look like an idiot out in public until that happens. I just don't think it's going to take off and it's only going to be this like niche fringe idea and so but i think and we're also in this pendulum swing of where like you said during the pandemic it was all online experiences and now i like i said we are in a loneliness epidemic the pendulum swing in the other way where i think people are going to want to get out and actually experience things versus put something on Mm. their face and be even more uh, detached and isolated from the world but you know it's We'll see. The world is crazy. I don't understand it ever. So I, I'm more I'm more apt to go outside and get some fresh air than I am to put something on my face f- for five hours. But I also just stare at a screen eight hours, ten hours a day anyway. So, who knows? Just a few inches far further yeah, right, away yeah. from the VR. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can say that Apple Vision Pro does look weird in public. Like, I was just flying, and there was actually a few people on my flight that had them on. And it's just, it sticks out. Like, it looks like ski goggles, but on steroids. Yeah. So, yeah, just have, like, this huge thing on your face. And people are looking at you. And it's just like, ah, this, that's not the look. But, I mean, you know, people used to think that it, your buds looked kind of weird, too. Like, even my wife, when I bought some, was like, you looks like you got two cigarettes hanging from your ears. And, you know, <laughs> and it does still look a little weird. But now everyone's wearing it. Like, it's not a weird thing anymore. Like, it's not that weird big bulky thing that people looked like they were talking to themselves and they turned you're like oh you have a thing in your ear so i think that's going to happen with the some type of you know like google glass had something that looked kind of more normal but you still look Mm kind of weird but i think it's number one the forum factor's got to improve and 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 number Mm -hmm. two it's got to look cool and then it's going to be a matter of time Mm -hmm. before it's ubiquitous and people are like yeah got this uh, camera on the face yeah no, no, exactly glass when you guys were dope. sorry no i said and i thought google glass actually looked pretty dope i mean it looked right out of dragon ball z right. you know how they had the yeah. viewfinder and everything in there so i thought that looked pretty dope but yeah 
Yeah, I think it was way too early for its time. I mean, it was, yeah. I, that was I, I so many years yeah. ago. So many years ago. But it, it's funny. What I wanted to say was you guys saying that it looked funny on people's faces. And I'm like, 10 years from now, people are going to watch this episode and no, laugh no. at <laughs> right. us because it's going to be the future. At that time, it's like normal. And probably we're like would making be fun of it. Yeah, probably 10 years from now, you yeah. would never no, no, know. But you know, did you, you guys saw Neuralink, right? The, 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 yes. the Neuralink the tweets, first yeah. patient who tweeted with a chip in his brain and play yeah. chess so i feel like this is just the gap closing in we're going to go from the vr to the glasses and then neural link's going to just keep advancing so the question i have for you guys is will you ever get a chip in your brain if Ooh. if you could enhance your capabilities uh, um uh, well what do we mean by enhanced capabilities like if i can't so, walk anymore and now i can walk no 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 as in better memory Maybe faster, uh, if you want to learn things, you'll better learn faster, better neuroplasticity. <laughs> better frame rate. Yes. 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 Higher <laughs> FPS when you go out. Up rest to AK <laughs> yes. or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, it's weird, right? Because anything like that could be hacked, right? So, like, I play Ooh. enough sci-fi games that... Um, this, the outcome is never great, right? Everybody is all <laughs> cyberkinetic, and then some terrorist group comes in, they hack everybody, and now nobody can control themselves, right? So I'm just like, yeah, oh, you know, it's like we're already dealing with enough scammers as it is just with our cell phones and everything. Imagine if mm. these scammers are like trying to get into your brain, like, yeah, it'd be nuts. I don't think I don't think what, I'm ready for it at least. Wasn't it wasn't it like a Black Mirror episode where uh, I think you see ads with the lens? There's oh like God. ads coming in. So if you don't pay yeah. enough, <laughs> you're gonna see ads and you can't skip it. I'm like, <laughs> like we're on this podcast right now. And suddenly I have ads in front of my eyes. Like ah, uh, skip, skip. That's gonna that's not gonna be good. Uh, EJ, will you get the chip? I I, I don't think so. I, I, what's interesting? What's more interesting to me is I was just listening to a podcast, uh, Neil Grass Neil deGrasse Tyson's podcast, where they're actually doing this kind of uh, like cell engineering, where they're de aging people to people to live longer. Yeah, well. And Ooh. I thought that was super fascinating because that's not like hacking your. I mean, I guess it could kind of be like hacking your cells, but I'm more interested in like, yeah, how do you like biohacking? Right. Like, how do you yeah. how do you uh, get rid of diseases and stuff like that? I, I'm I don't I think for someone that is blind or like they're you're, they're curing blindness with stuff like that or like even getting more like motor function back to limbs and stuff like that. That makes sense for those types of people. I I, I think I think the whole biohacking thing is closer than people, it, but it's very weird. Like you know, people are so like, oh, I don't want this or that, but I'm fine with shoving a chip in my head. Like I'm totally the government's not going to get me there. Like you have a chip in your head. Like okay, if you're worried about the government doing stuff, where they hack right in right there. Yes. Um, not that I'm like yes. you know, uh, paranoid of that kind of stuff, but um, but yeah, I think that's just. Uh, Weird. I don't know. Wow. Will Files, you? Would you get it? Get get one? I don't know. I I was about to say yes until Jonathan yeah, brought actually, up. Yeah, actually, I was the, about to say yes. yes. When Jonathan mentioned about <laughs> hacking thing. I was like, I don't want to watch. Yeah, like cyberpunk punk, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, like yeah. I've I played those. So the, I, know, I don't know no now. At yeah, the moment, definitely no. not. Not I think about it. Definitely yeah, not. Hacking no, no. Teslas. I, would, I, I really wish. No, 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 no. I wouldn't want that. And the thing is, you wouldn't even know you're hacked sometimes, right? So they would hack you and you wouldn't even be aware. You just change. So that suddenly your behavior changes. And that, that yeah. will be a very crazy world to live in. But I don't think it's far-fetched. I mean, if, if somebody can tweet with the chip today, I, 10 years from now, who knows what's going to happen. NVIDIA also announced their robots. Oh, I my God. You Did you guys saw? see GTC? The announcement that Jensen made for the robots, that, yeah. was, that was crazy. I saw the cute robot, the yeah. one that yeah. didn't look like it was going to murder you. So I'm cool with that. <laughs> that's that's, that's, with that's that. what they always uh, begin. Yeah, they a little cute one, like BB-8 looking thing, and then it's just got like yeah. a, a knife that shoves out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Someone I mean, there is a, a cool... I see, there is a cool... Um, I don't think it was at GTC. I think it was just on Twitter, but someone had a... Um, 
a bionic arm, but it was controlled by AI. So they were able to control their arm by thinking about it, like how they would with their limbs. So I think it was like a war what? veteran that lost his arm. So they gave him this AI arm and he was controlling it just like a normal arm, just by this AI chip that was able to like sense what his brain was thinking, which I thought that was pretty dope. Wow, wow, that's impressive. That is fascinating. But for GTC, someone commented, this looks like Skynet trailer, right? right like out in of the beginning Terminator, of a yeah. Skynet trailer. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. It's, it's scary, but again, it's, it's exciting and scary at the same time. I feel like technology is always like that. Um, I want to just change the flow of the conversation a little bit. And this is more about you guys and the fact that you guys have accomplished so much in your career. So many people look up to both of you. So... The question I have, and I want to go one by one, maybe we'll start with Jonathan. What is the biggest mistake you think you've made in your career that you look back on, you reflect on, and you could give advice on to people so that they don't make that same mistake? Yeah, I would just say, like, if there's something that you want to get into, just do it. Like, I always tell, like, I only have one um, thing that I really harp on myself about, and that's not starting YouTube earlier. Like, back in the day, Mm -hmm. YouTube was looked at, it was actually looked down upon inside of our industry. And um, this is like pre Nick Campbell or Andrew Kramer, like nobody was on YouTube yet really doing stuff. But I did have a group of friends that um, they were all doing YouTube stuff and they were getting really big on YouTube. Like uh, Michelle Pham, she actually became like a big beauty artist. She was probably like the first and she came out with a makeup line afterwards and she blew up, became a millionaire. Um, my friends, Far East Movement, they got a record deal off of online. So I was seeing like the internet being, or YouTube being something that could actually help your career. And I was starting to think about getting in there, but then a lot of people kind of deterred me from it. They're like, no real artists are doing YouTube and that's just, you know, looked down upon and looking at it now, I mean, look at, all the stuff that people have been accomplishing doing YouTube. So if I would have started like 16 years ago, who knows where I would be at this day, but you know, Mm -hmm. everything happens for a reason. But I would say, don't let people deter you from what you want to do. Like if I would have just listened to my gut and started it way back, you know, like 15 years ago, then I'd probably be in a different position at this point. Can I just say that's beautiful? I saw another podcast and it said that the reason why friends or family, sometimes close friends and family deter you from that, it's not that they're necessarily or particularly evil and they want they don't want you to grow. It's just they're used to the, the you now and the fact that you're going yeah. to have to change to become who you want to become. They do not like that. They just like the you now. And it's not, again, they're not trying to put you down. It's just... Again, they want things to stay the same way because they're comfortable that way. And so what you said is absolutely true because I feel like if you're ever going to do anything different in your life to help yourself grow, you're always going to have people around you, either close friends, close family members, that are going to tell you, hey, I don't think you should do that. It's a bad decision. It's risky. And (laughs) again, they want you to be safe. Again, that's why the bad decision (laughs) name came around. So I genuinely believe what you say is so true. And I hope that people watching and listening will listen to that because I... Anybody at any point in your life, you have something you like to do, something new. It could be starting exercising. It could be going to the gym. It could be starting a new um, YouTube channel. It could be starting a new career. So I hope that they listen to that message. It's, it, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I would. EJ, how about your biggest, biggest bad decision? Yeah, I mean. Or biggest mistake, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would. I, I, I just feel like I, at least my personal journey lately has been a lot about what Winbush just brought up about just don't feel like you have to fit in some other cog just because everyone else is doing something else. It's like, you know, I, you, you mentioned how you canceled and then resubscribed and canceled mid journey. And I think it was just one of these things where I was like, okay, well, everyone's doing this. I guess I have to learn this. But at the end of the day, I'm like, I had to step back and I had to realize I'm like, why did I get into art? to begin with was it to create Mm. to type out in discord and and create an (laughs) image like no that's not like and i i I, when we went to ringling i I, part of a a talk that i did there i was like you have to think about like if art turns to that are you gonna stick with it just because or are you gonna like actually be like you know what i'm out like this isn't what i signed up for when i first got into this and so I think it's it's especially important now to like find the joy in what like I always it's like just Marie are you gonna Marie Kondo this like 
Like if it doesn't bring you joy, like stop doing it. Like joy, don't yes, don't yes, do yes. it anymore. And so for me, I was getting pretty uh, you know, anxious about everything that's going on and I you know, through school emotion, like I try to be a positive voice and, and give people advice and stuff like that. And one of my big things is like find find that joy in your life. Like why why did you get into this uh, to begin with? I think most people that you know, we, we work with clients and sometimes it's great. Some, most of the time it probably sucks though. It's not very creative, but like, I think the, the biggest thing for me is, uh, I guess you could just boil down to like, make sure you take time for yourself, whether that's creating for yourself, whether that's doing your own hobbies, like, because if, if your work life is getting stressed out and it's just stressful all the time, like think about what, what you can do, like whether you want to stick with it or you, you, how can you supplement that? So for me, it was, you know, falling in love with like making, you know, physical toys and getting a 3D printer and, and like getting into sculpting and, and creating for myself. You know, it's pretty crazy. We're, you know, when Bush mentioned we're at Ringling, which, uh, you know, is this school with all these talented artists that are like, they were showing their demo reels for their senior uh, project. And I'm like, man, this is better than my reel like today. Like, holy crap. <laughs> and, and, and one of the things that I asked during my keynote, I was like, how many people like regularly create for themselves and like maybe out of like a hundred and something people, maybe three people, five people raise their hand. I'm like, geez, I was like, I was like, if you're, if you're always creating for a client and you're really into art, like, what are you doing? Like, cause we, we used mm. to create for ourselves all the time as kids and in, and in college, I would hope in college you, you have enough time to create for yourself. So I think that's, I think it's important to create for yourself, especially now when you, you there's all this anxiety around the, the places when the Sora stuff came out, you know, I was doom scrolling and, you know, just seeing how everyone else was reacting to it. And I was like, you know what? I can't control that, but I can control what I can do about this. And what mm -hmm. I'm doing right now is I'm logging off. I'm going outside, went for a long walk and that cleared my mind. I'm like, you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to go and I'm going to sketch, uh, 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 like go sculpt something on my iPad. And I did, and I felt mm -hmm. much better. And I felt like I was actually doing something that I enjoyed. And it, and it, another thing it did is it reminded me that like, I love art. I love what I'm doing and I'm going to fight like hell to keep doing this and, and doing what I love for as long as I can before the robots phase me out. Mm -hmm. But again, it was just, <laughs> and that's empowering, right? Like knowing you have control of yourself and what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, I think if, <laughs> I think if you're in the mindset and a, a lot of people ask me this too, is like, should I fight AI? Like, what should I do? And I'm like, what does that even mean? <laughs> fight AI? Like you're not <laughs> fighting. Do you see How those robots? They're going to kick that. our asses. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Will Smith fought AI, right? Right. Yeah. You're not <laughs> yes. the Terminator. Yeah. Like, um, so it's, just, and I think that's an important thing is, mm. is understanding that there are things you can't control in your life, but there's a lot of things you can. And I think remembering that and that's empower, uh, empowering. And especially with all mm. this new software that's coming out, a lot of people get stressed about that, but I'm like, think about how much you've learned to this point. Like if you've learned all the right things, you've learned the fundamentals, like it's just another software, like everything kind of works similar. So it's also, uh, you know, a, a thing I always do is like reminding myself, like it's not always about the next thing. Like sometimes it's, it's important to look back and see how much you've accomplished and take those past wins to fuel future wins and always maintaining that perspective. I think that's that's very accurate and I think a lot of people don't spend time creating for themselves and that could cause burnout, that could cause a lot of other problems. Both of you have had successful careers working with other people, being freelancers and working in studios. A, l a lot of questions that we get, especially for artists who are starting out, is about should I start as a freelancer or should I go work in a studio? If someone asks you guys this question, what would be your answer? Imagine someone is just starting out. I mean, Winbush has the yeah, perfect story say, to sell on why you should go in person. Yeah, I say go in person. Like I learned more in my six months as an intern 
as I did at my entire time at university, like just being and, you know, being around fellow artists and being able to have that local communication and have that inspiration, just looking around at all the talent around you, like you'll just build so much more than going out and freelance and trying to figure it out yourself. And then also it's like if you're working at a studio, you're going to work, you're going to learn organizational skills, which is really important for an artist. And a lot of artists just throw everything at the work and they don't know how to name their stuff or how to, you know, build out a proper folder structure. So learning how to organize will make you not only efficient, but also faster. Um, you know, you'll create contacts as well. A lot of people that I started off in this industry with, you know, I started off at Happy Madison with Adam Sandler and them. A lot of those people went on to work at Sony, Universal, Warner Brothers. And so that's how I was able to go work at all those studios because I had friends in all these places. Right. So everybody kind of spreads out and you always have connections in those areas. So you're building out your network as well. And then also that just having that steady stream of income while you're learning. That's a big um, that's a big help, too, because as a freelancer, you're paid for hire. So you get paid mm -hmm. for one project and then you don't know when your next project's going to be coming, especially if you're just starting out. You might have like a two month gap in there. So just being able to focus on becoming a better artist while having that steady stream of income is also very helpful, especially for your mental health, because as artists, we deal with mental health a lot. That's a big issue that we kind of don't deal with until it's too late. So just having that security blanket is really big. Um, I don't know. Am I missing anything else in there, EJ? No, I think that that about covers it. I think I, I, I also agree with a lot of what Woodenbush said. I was like, when I when I got out of school, I didn't know what I didn't know. Like I didn't also, I didn't go to school for this. So actually getting in an in, in internship and learning on the job was totally critical. Like I know when Bush, you were saying how you learned, like you didn't know a lot of the stuff, you know, the Hollywood grind and all that stuff before you, uh, you know, you got into things and even his journey into learning unreal was kind of by accident. And, uh, you know, and those are those opportunities that you won't get when you're you're in person. The one thing I will say is, and he, actually Nick Campbell, I remember him saying this a while back, is like, don't when you find yourself, you you don't want to be the you want to be the dumbest person in the room. When you yeah, okay. become the the smartest person in the room, it's time to change rooms. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. for the very first job I ever had. I was definitely the dumbest person in the room and that was great because I learned so much from, you know, there was a light wave artist there. There was a really good after effects artist there and I didn't know after effects. I didn't know animation. I didn't know 3d. So it was just like, I would sit next to these guys and, and just absorb mm -hmm. everything. And I learned a lot more than I ever would have. And this was also before the days of an Andrew Kramer and online tutorials and stuff like that. So it was even more critical for me then. But then I went to another job and I was, I was the smartest person in the room. And that was, that was kind of, I don't know, it, it kind of demoralizes you in a way because at least in my situation, I was surrounded by people that wanted to keep things easy and like, just don't mm -hmm. put more effort in than you need to. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, I love making this. I don't like making mediocre stuff every day it was kind of like working at the burger king of of motion design where it's like we're making these soggy ass burgers they don't taste very good we don't even know if that's real meat there uh but you know and it's like i want to you know i want to work at you know a, a michelin star restaurant where people care about what they're making and so mm. um i think it, it the the knife kind of goes both ways where yes in person but also sometimes in person's not all that it's cracked up to be so you need to make sure that the the in-person job is really what you want because it was it was being in that job the in-person job in this in the internal team that made me be like you know what i've i've hit my limit here and so i'm going freelance and so i even learned a lot more that mm -hmm. way too and that freed me up to go to nab and all these conferences and meet people like winbush and and so i think it's you know it's a healthy mix and I think you need to really take stock of whatever situation it is, uh, because some some people love freelance, but it's not for everyone. Like I had my freelance mm -hmm. kick and now I'm at school motion full time and I love being part of a team and not worrying about, OK, I've wrapped up a project. Where's my next project coming from? So it definitely takes a certain type of person. Mm -hmm. It's really important to know that when you go work at a company and then you go freelance, 
you do take that discipline with you because when you're working with a company, you're working with a team, you're working in, in, within timelines. When you go freelance, if you start away, right away after college to go into freelance, I think it's going to be quite difficult for you to have that discipline because you never had somebody over you telling you to deliver yeah. something in a timeline. Unless you talk about college and university where I think a lot of people would have just not cared. If, even if the teacher would ask you to do something, you'll still find a way to go around that. But when it comes to real life, real work, real jobs, you kind of get that discipline. I think it, it becomes really valuable. So even if you do not like working in a team, I think having the experience is going to be really helpful for you to carry to you when you become a freelance. And I think it works vice versa as well if you work freelance and then you go work with the team i think trying both out is is a good idea because if you don't try both out you never know what the other one is like just like how ej mentioned he do he does like being in a team at the moment um i i know you guys are working on a lot of different projects simultaneously games 3d printing we got youtube videos you got courses coming out so i want to ask you guys what are the, the most exciting things that people should be looking forward to from both of you jonathan maybe we can start with you we've seen some of the stuff but maybe we can spill the beans on some of the other things yeah no right now i'm all in on on the Fortnite stuff so uefn finishing up the stuff with um Mythic man of wu-tang clan and then the stuff with mix master mike Hopefully, I could get EJ off his butt so we could get our game going. We've been <laughs> talking about this this Pug Dash game for years. So, yeah, EJ and I got to get our stuff together there. And then, um, yeah, I just really want to see how far I can push it with Fortnite. Like, I know there's a ton of opportunity there. I'm still doing client work and motion graphics on the side, right? Like, um, have some Netflix shows that will be coming out soon. I can't say what they are until mm -hmm. they actually come out. But, you know, still doing motion graphics there. Still working mm -hmm. on tutorials. I got some more Unreal motion designer tutorials that are going to be coming out because I know a lot of people are excited about the cloner stuff in Unreal right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. But there's so many more tools that people aren't focusing on or even know that that is there. So that's the type of stuff that I want to focus on and put that knowledge out there. So, yeah, I would just say look at my youtube channel for all the cool stuff that's coming out oh please do i'm looking forward to the motion design yes, uh, motion tutorials, design yeah. tutorials are you using the unreal engine motion design tab specifically for some of these netflix work that you, you're talking about or have you not started implementing that yet in in your uh, client work <clears throat> no i didn't put it into the client work yet because i was on the beta and the beta kept changing right so with every mm -hmm. iteration of the beta some stuff would break or they would change the UI a little bit. And actually with the version that's out right now in um, Unreal Engine 5.4, it's under preview right now. Mm -hmm. So even though a lot of it's pretty much locked in, there is some flexibility there to where some stuff might change by the time the final version comes out when 5.4 finally comes out. And so it's one of those things that I like waiting for the final version before I actually start putting it into client work because I made that mistake back in the day, right? Whenever Unreal Engine 5 came out, it was in alpha. I was excited. Um, I was working on a history channel on this TV show. I'm like, okay, I'm going all in. Then in 5.5 or 5.0 alpha. And then they came out with 5.0 proper and everything just broke oh because they changed God. a bunch of stuff in there. So I almost had to start from scratch on a lot of it. Like luckily I knew people at Epic, they were able to, come in and help me fix a project but like i literally almost lost like two months worth of work oh, overnight shit. just oh by God. them updating unreal there so i'm like okay listen learn when they say don't use this for client work i don't use it for client work so hey farrah listen yeah, to that right. man listen to that yeah. that's that's no that's we that's really true yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's because you me. get excited you see all the new tools Actually, you want to use the problem we did with persistent data on fortnite yes because uefn just i think the persistent data was recently released right it yeah. was, I think, a few weeks ago, and we used it on a map. Luckily, we removed it. Okay, fine. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Don't, do yeah. not go straight away and use the, the new tools until they're proven and they are not buggy. So, yes, I agree yeah, with you. Yeah, if you see the experimental uh, quotations on the side, then, yeah, that don't, like, you're, you're um, taking a risk by using those functions in there. So, just, you know, keep that in mind. 100% man we're looking forward to it checking out your channel for the tutorials and also hopefully we're gonna see the games come out in in YouTube as well I hope you're making some videos about that so that people can see I know you're already doing some tutorials how you brought yourself into the game we looked at that it was awesome I'm looking forward yeah, to see you. more of that um, 
And EJ, what about you? What do we have? Because I, I've, I've, again, I think I brought it up in the very beginning of the podcast. The 3D printing stuff looks so cool. We even texted you about that because I've always wanted to have one. Should we get one? Oh, yes. Ah, there yeah, you go. So that, this is my Wacom pen so awesome. holder. <laughs> my little uh, yeah, Gus the Pug Wacom pen holder so you can wow. do that. Is it Dude. your first 3D printer? It's or my is first it, 3D uh, printer. And so that, uh, okay. going back to the whole what is making things more accessible to artists the 3d printer i have which i might be able to well, i'll just do this over here the, it's right over there oh, it's there a bamboo yes. labs 3d filament printer that's awesome and uh i absolutely love it uh and that was one of the things where like i have a bunch of buddies that have 3d printers but you have it they're resin printers you have to deal with toxic chemicals mm. and clean up and i'm like I know enough about myself that that's way too much friction for me to keep up with that. And so this is one of the, like it's one CNET awards and stuff like that. It uses AI technology. Ooh. Oh, and no. I know. Oh, Holy no, crap. There you go. Oh, no. Went to the other side. 3d <laughs> printer <laughs> jobs. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it's, basically plug and play like there's a little bit of maintenance and like cleaning but i was shocked that it uh you know you you basically the software you use i brought in a model from uh nomad sculpt and like i kept all mm -hmm. the objects separate so i could color things differently and the, the printer i got is multicolor, so you can use different colors mm -hmm. filament and we'll just print it in for you i wish i still had my model i actually gave it away at ringling for a prize but uh <laughs> i need to do it again but like the quality is like super good there's a little bit of sanding but like it's super smooth uh and you would think that it was almost like a, a resin printer and it like i said it's so easy to 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 make so it, i got addicted to it uh, I'm using it to like prototype uh, like things that I might want to make into a vinyl toy line because uh, I'm actually uh, my first line of vinyl toys is actually on a big cargo ship coming from China to LA right now and wow. this is the little prototype yes. of it and, uh, and so this so is cool. like made of resin it's got a little magnet little happy seal friend on it and that, uh, that so it's awesome. that same character and so you know, I'm getting into a lot of the physical world stuff. And one of the things that, you know, I talked about how, you know, people that have that can tell good stories and all that kind of stuff are going to be the most successful. And I almost, and I as I preach that, I'm like, you know, I suck at telling stories like it's just, it's just something like when you make something. And I mean, I'm sure you guys actually think of this because you make more cinematography, like cinema, cinema, cinema. Cine, cinematic that's the word cinematic type mm. types render is like you probably think about the story you're telling with the star wars piece right but like mm. i didn't necessarily do like i'm just doing client work or whatever i'm i'm making a tutorial the story is not something i ever really thought about and so i was like that's an area i want to you know get better at and so what i've been doing is following more character artists more more uh, mm. artists that do like character IP and like tell stories mm. around like that character brand. Uh, and so, you know, when mm -hmm. Winbush and I went to Korea, one of the things that was super eye opening is like almost every single brand has some kind of mascot that has some type of personality and and story to them. And and, and I, I, I was like, that that's so cool. Like, that's one big way to help you know, tell a brand story. And so, you know, while, uh, Fortnite's a cool way to promote a brand, like what if you actually made, like if they ever unlock it to a point, you make your own character, that's that brand mascot. And it's mm. in that world too. Like that part of things, mm. like it really interests me cause it taps into my love of like creating characters and the rigging part of things. And, and now I got this like physical, uh, aspect to it. So, uh, I got the, this toy and then I'm, I'm probably going to do another plushie and, and my wife and I are collabing on like a children's book. Uh, so it's, it's just really, it's just really a fun, uh, alternative. Like I'm sure Winbush fields with like doing the unreal Fortnite stuff. It's just a really other cool creative outlet that you can use your current skills and do mm -hmm. something completely different with it. Um, so mm -hmm. that's, what's uh, exciting mm -hmm. me now. And what I'm, I'm getting into is, uh, some more physical stuff and the, the storytelling aspects of, of characters. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. We saw it on your Instagram for anybody that doesn't know on Instagram, EJ is always posting about some of these cool 3D prints that he's doing. So please definitely go check that out. Now, 
again, you guys have been amazing. This four man podcast is is way <laughs> better than amazing. I even expected. There's so many cool things that we talked about, and I do hope one day we can do this in person. That would be the coolest way Absolutely. to just go to the next level. And for that, I have to ask because you guys always do tours. Do you have any tours coming up? Anything that you guys have planned? Um, tour wise, still trying to work on which cities to hit next. I know we have NAB coming up in a few mm-hmm. weeks. That's going to be in Las Vegas. And then, um, SIGGRAPH, of course, that's going to be in Denver this year. Um, still trying to make it out to Dubai there, out where you guys are mm-hmm. at, been trying to really make that happen. You guys sit down and make that figured out. Um, hoping to go mm-hmm. back to Asia, you know, Southeast Asia again later this year, but Nothing really cemented in stone. We're still just trying to um, figure out where we need to land. Yeah. No, 100%. I hope I hope that we can make it happen as well. We'll definitely have the chat. And for anybody watching and listening, we'll let you guys know if anything happens. But again, thank you so, so much, Jonathan and EJ. You guys have been amazing. And I hope that we get to see more of your awesome videos and awesome content, awesome tutorials online. Yeah, we say we need another two hours because EJ brought up the IP stuff. I mean, that's like huge for artists right there. Like you were saying mm-hmm. about how you used to play Roblox. Like mm-hmm. a lot of people that built levels in Roblox and built their own characters and brands, that stuff is now being sold in stores. Like I see oh. like toys at Walmart at Five Below that, you know, they started as Roblox levels and became popular. Wow. And now they're on backpacks and lunch boxes. So it's like as artists, like we... We have a lot of power. We just don't utilize it, especially when it comes to making your own properties. Wait, I didn't know about that Roblox thing. No, Did I you didn't know about that? No, I didn't. Yeah. Some of the popular levels, like um, there's a really popular level called Piggy. I don't know if you guys know Piggy, but that became a toy line. They got vinyl toys, backpacks. Like there's a whole lot of stuff, but a lot of those really popular Roblox levels, like they're getting brand deals. Like it, it's pretty amazing. But wow. again, you have well, to have so a good character and good Roblox. story. Yeah. Wow. I thought it's the other Ooh. way around. I thought they start, they bring it I, to Roblox, Roblox to advertise it, but now they I, start from Roblox. But I get it now. So if let's say you create a game within Fortnite and you get enough eyes on it, then you can't, if let's say you're EJ and you made that game, then you can go ahead and use the elements within that map to go and create wow. physical toys. toys. Wow. That, Okay. That opens up a whole new possibility of what you can do. And Fortnite has so many eyes on it. So if you do make a good map, not just good looking map, but also fun game. A good game. story. Yeah, a good story, fun game. There's so many possibilities that can come from that. Yeah, okay. stories we- and characters and mascots. Like you, you have to have a good mascot, like EJ was saying. Like If you have a good character that people can resonate with, then the possibilities are endless based off of that character. So character, story, like that's going to open it up for you. You know, you're absolutely right when it comes to the IP. There's now that you opened my mind, there's so much we can talk about. Why don't we? So the next time we have this conversation, yeah. <laughs> we're going to see one where Fortnite has gone, because we had that question that we asked ourselves, hey, wh- how, how is this going to look in, in a year's time? We, we, so we're working on a UFN map right now. It's not publicly launched yet, but it's going to be, I think, next week. Yep. Next week. And then you, you're, uh, Jonathan, working on two maps, as you mentioned yourself. And EJ and Jonathan, I'm looking for that game that you guys, you guys have to work, gonna work on work together. On it. It's going to happen. I mean, yeah. that could be huge, right? Yeah. yeah. No, 100%. And then we can talk about how this has gone. I would love to have that conversation. But again, you guys have been awesome. Thank you so, so much. I'm looking forward to everything you guys are going to create. We're going to put the links of both your social platforms on the in the description below so that anybody watching and listening can check it out. There's so many amazing pieces of content coming out on a daily, weekly, some of the monthly basis. So please check that out. And for everybody watching and listening, thank you so, so much. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Ciao. Ciao.